Um, good morning and happy Sabbath. Here is our program for today. We will have song service in, by um, Neil Sarazaga. And then we will have announcements. The program will continue. Pastor Siciliano will do opening prayer. Our opening song today will be number 308, Holy Thine. Um, scripture reading, 2 Kings 22, verses 8 through 11, will be given by Emmanuel Arevalo. And then our intercessory prayer will be given by Raquel de Guzman. Um, offering emphasis will be provided by Alexiem Amogus. And then our music for that section will be by the Uniti siblings. Special music by Theodore Galau. And our message for today is called Recipe for Revival, given to us by Pastor Siciliano. Closing him will be number 330, Take My Life and Let It Be. And we will close out our program this morning with benediction by Carlos Ulysses Vera. At this time, we will continue with our song service. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, for our first song, I guess um, I will be sharing with you one of my favorites. It's called Savior Like a Shepherd. It's on hymn number 545, hymn 545.
We will continue our service with announcements for January 9th, 2021. Just a reminder that we have a website, www.jacksonheightschurch.org. Please go onto that website and um, learn more about what's happening in the church. However, if you need to get information and you want to get information about what is currently happening in the church, please join Flocknote. And how do you do that? Send a text JHCA to 84576. When you do that, you will get instructions on how to sign up. This way, you can be reminded of everything that's happening whenever there's a service, whenever, um, if there's a change in the Zoom login, when we are reopening church. So um, uh, join Flocknote. Okay, our weekly and nightly Bible studies, the personal ministry nightly Bible studies will continue on January 18th. Right now, um, there's another program going on and so it will continue on January 18th. The weekly Saturday evening Bible study continues at six o'clock every Saturday evening. Wednesday night prayer meeting, will resume on January 20th, and Friday night Vespers will resume on January 22. And the reason that this is happening is because Jackson Heights Seventh-day Adventist Church is totally involved in participating with the General Conference sponsored 10 days of prayer with the theme this year of seeking revival. It started last Wednesday with Pastor Siciliano, and we've had other speakers. Ken Moiga spoke, and Moinia Mpundu spoke. Tonight, join us as Jay Quadra will present the message. And um, we have more young people every night until January 15th, and then we will celebrate on January 16th on Sabbath. Come on out and join us. And the, general, the Greater New York Conference of Seventh-day Advantage each day sends out a prayer and from each of the um, leaders of the, of the conference. And um, if you would like to get more about this, please go to gnyc.org. And each day, a different ministry director um, offers a prayer. Yes, we have a new ministry. It's up and coming. It's just starting. Bread distribution, bread ministry. God has been blessing. And um, through prayers, you know, we were wondering what can we as a church do to support the community? And one person was able to contact another person after these prayers, and we were able to get a lot of bread. And so this afternoon, between two o'clock and three o'clock, please go out and um, support and help to distribute the breads that we have received. Following that, following today, we are trying to decide when we will continue. We will, by God's grace. This is something that God has given us. And so we will figure out when we will be distributing the bread. Will it be Sabbath afternoon or will it be another, but another day? But if you would like to be a part of this ministry, please reach out to Cheryl and Eli Salavante and get more information. We're looking for people to come out and to help distribute. And people may say, this is, you know, we should have done this before, but everything is in God's time. And this is here now, come on out and help. Today it's between two and three. And if you need bread for yourself and your family, come on out and um, get the blessing. AY this afternoon, 
The message, the speaker will be Jeffrey Abatayo. Come on out and support our young people at the AY program. The prayer line every morning, 5.30 a.m. to 6 a.m. The number is listed here, the access code is listed. Please come on out and join us. It's very active and vibrant. The Greater New York Conference um, sponsors a stewardship training for 2021. To register for this, please go to gnyc.org. It is tomorrow, January 10th, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And it will be on Zoom. But in order to get the passcode, you need to register. So go to gnyc.org and look for this flyer. Think bigger. GNYC Stewardship Training 2021. And they will send you the code once you've registered. On January 31st, 2021, the Greater New York Conference is sponsoring and offering the workshop. The, um, it's a virtual GNYC communication workshop. And again, to register, you need to go to gnyc.org and they will give you the information of how to participate in this. You know, we're now in a different era when it comes to communication within our church. And here they will be talking about social media engagement strategy, technology in our church, live streaming 3.0, um, streaming production software, survival copyright IQ for communicators. So much that we in the 21st century in 2021, need to know in order to continue to, um, to have church in, in, as we go forward. Men's Ministry of Greater New York Conference is sponsoring the 26th Annual Men's Prayer Convention. It will be Friday, April 30th to Sunday, May 2nd. This, by God's grace, will be alive at um, um, Honors Haven, Resort and Spa in Ellenville, New York. To register, please go to www.adventsource.org and look for Led by the Spirit Men's Ministry Prayer Convention. Yes, we continue with her birthday celebrations. And um, here is the list of birthday celebrants for January. Please reach out to them and let them know that you are thinking about them and uh, give them well wishes. If you would like more information on anything that was given today, please send an email to jhchurchclerk at gmail.com or you may call 347-868-7107. Have a good day and God bless. Uh, we'll be singing Holy, Holy, Holy in hymn number 73. church shall we pray together father in heaven we look up to you on another day a beautiful sunny day a day that we have so many resources available to us and we say thank you we ask that you would continue to pour out your blessings 
with us as you promised when we gather to worship and to be together in your name and in your fellowship. We also pray for the healing of the world. Let this day be a day of rejoicing and renewal. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We will continue our worship with our opening song, Holy Thine, in hymn number 308. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading will be taken from 2 Kings 22, verses 8 through 11. That's 2 Kings 20 through 8 through 11. And it says, Hekiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan, the secretary, went to the king and reported to him, your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and has entrusted to it to the workers and the supervisors of the temple. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hekiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it in front of the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Oh, 
morning, I want to start by reading the word of 2 Corinthians 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our God who sits in the throne, the mighty throne, we'll welcome you. This morning, Jackson High comes in a humble way to ask for forgiveness of our sins, the lack of our faith and trust in you. Forgive us, give us the strength, the Holy Spirit to repent and to resist all temptation. Lord, we lay our request prayers Many hearts are hurting, are in pain. Be merciful, you say, for everyone who acts, receive. You are a God of love. We will answer, you will answer our needs and more. And thank you for your love, dear God. We are living in a desperate world. Confusion, hate, sorrow, pain, loneliness, this virus has destroyed so many lives, a nation that is divided. Our faith has been tested. May we hold on to the gospel, the truth, the cross, the promise of Jesus' return. Pour us with your Holy Spirit and love to bring Jesus to others and who, who does not know you. Bless the speaker, Pastor Siciliano, his message that will bring closer to you changes in our life through the Holy Spirit. Open our minds, our hearts to receive your holy word. Thank you, dear Lord, for answering our prayers. Amen. Church, uh, we're joining you from Armenia, two hours away from Jackson Heights Church. I hope everybody is warm. I'm looking at my uh, weather.com app and it says you have about the same temperatures degrees, but it's saying that in Jackson Heights, it's it feels like 25. Over here, it feels 12 degrees, so you can see the difference. Anyway, I, I, I hope that everybody is warm, not only physically, but in spirit. Uh, this is, we are now at a part of a program where we have the privilege of participating in, a, in an act of stewardship, which is in the giving of our tithes and offerings. Uh, considering what has been happening or what has happened the past year, and up to this point, and we don't know when this will end, it's so easy uh, for us to, to say that uh, it's difficult financially. I know uh, less income for some, for some even worse, loss of a job. And it's so easy to say, the Lord will understand uh, if I cannot participate in the act of fully and you know, rightfully. Uh, there's here's an interesting before we proceed. Here's an interesting excerpt from the uh, book, Councils on Stewardship, and I'd like to, I'd like you to follow as I share my screen. Just take a, a minute or two. Let me try this. I hope you're sharing my screen now. Can you see the screen, Brother Feliciano? Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'd like you to follow. Uh, and this is for our meditation as we 
participate in this service. Experience shows that a spirit of benevolence is more frequently found among those of limited means than among those more wealthy. Many who greatly desire riches would be ruined by their possessions. When such persons are entrusted with talents of means, they too often hoard or waste the Lord's money until the master says to them individually, thou shalt be no longer a steward. They dishonestly use that which is another's as though it were their own. God will not entrust them with eternal riches. The poor man's gift, the fruit of self-denial to extend the precious light of truth is as fragrant incense before God. Every act of self-sacrifice for the good of others will strengthen the spirit of beneficence in the giver's heart. Allying him more closely to the redeemer of the world who was rich yet for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. The smallest sum given cheerfully as the result of self-denial is of more value in the sight of God than the offerings of those who could give thousands and yet feel no lack. The poor widow who cast two mites into the treasure of the Lord, showed love, faith, and benevolence. God's blessings upon the sincere offering has made it the source of great results. The widow's might has been like a tiny stream of flowing, flowing down through the ages, widening and deepening in its course and contributing in a thousand directions to the extension of the truth and the relief of the needy. The influence of that small gift has acted and reacted upon thousands of hearts in every age and in every country. As a result, numbered gifts have flowed into the treasure of the Lord from the liberal self-denying poor. And again, her example has stimulated to good works thousands of ease-loving, selfish, and doubting ones. And their gifts also have gone to swell the value of their offerings. Uh, let us meditate on these words as we uh, give our tithes and offerings. Thank you. Um, now we're going to have a uh, music for Unite's siblings.
Amen. I would like to request everyone to bow down their heads in prayer. We thank you once again, Lord, for allowing us uh, to participate in your service and to be, be good stewards. Father, we pray that you will continue to sustain us, not only physically, financially, but most of all spiritually. And please allow us to thrive even in these most difficult times. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we will continue to be faithful until till the very end. This we pray in the loving name of Jesus. Amen.
I'm tempted to say we should just end the service right there. That was very sweet and inspiring, moving. I also want to say thanks to Sam and Nathan and Emmanuel, and everybody did a good job. So thanks. Thank you all for your participation. So uh, our sermon today comes at the beginning of our 10 days of prayer. It's an annual event sponsored by the General Conference, which Jackson Heights takes part in. And uh, us two pastors, myself and Pastor Christian, were asked to contribute, do our part to contribute to the theme. Uh, Pastor Hanau is now up at Hartsdale working with the youth, so he's on site there today. He's not, I don't believe he's back yet or joining us here, but he will cap off the week's events next week uh, during the Sabbath for his presentation. So with all of that in mind, let's get started. I would like to turn your attention to 2 Kings chapter 22. 2 Kings chapter 22. The theme for this year's 10 days of prayer is revival. So I decided it would be good to take a look at Josiah. He's a hero of revival in the Old Testament. Let's look at his story as it unfolds in 2 Kings and try to identify what lessons or principles his efforts and example might have to impart to us today in our own times. We'll start in chapter 22. We'll go through section by section. We won't read every verse because you'll get the idea uh, as it goes. But I think we can enjoy just following the story and then highlighting the different issues as we go along. So let's start right at the beginning, where it introduces uh, Josiah. This is in 2 Kings chapter 22, right in the first verse. This is what it says. <clears throat> Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned for 31 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, sight of the Lord, and walked entirely in the way of his father David, and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. So, uh, if you're familiar with the Book of Kings, you'll know that each time it introduces a new king, it kind of gives a short summary statement, right? So these these two verses fit the pattern. Um, it tells about how old he was when he took office, how long. His, uh, his reign lasted, and it gives an overall assessment of whether he was a good or bad king. So the introduction already makes it clear that Josiah was faithful, right? And as we will see, he was a reformer. He wasn't just personally faithful, but he acted it out into, in the country, right? And it had a salutary effect on the nation's well-being. So now what I would like to do is kind of survey the parts of the story and see which components went in to making his reign a success, or as I called it in the sermon title, I want to see which ingredients went into Josiah's recipe for revival. So let's get to where the action starts. Go back to 2 Kings verse, uh, chapter 22. We're going to stay there so you can keep your Bibles open there. <clears throat> in verse 3, it says, <clears throat> Now, in the 18th year of King Josiah. So if he took, if he was uh, appointed king when he was eight, so he's now 26 years old, right? In the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent Shaphan or Shaphan, I'm not sure how to say that correctly in the Hebrew. The king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe to the house of the Lord saying, go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, and have him count all the money brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected from the people, and have them handed over to the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and have them give it to the workmen who are in the house of the Lord to repair the damage to the house, to the carpenters, the builders, the masons, and for buying timber and cut stone to repair the house. However, he adds this very interesting thing in verse 7, however, no accounting shall be made with them for the money handed over to them because they deal honestly. Now, we'll get back to, chapter, to that verse in a little bit, but I just wanted to point it out because it is kind of unique. All right, so the action starts. This is when the king is just starting to, I guess, 
assert his his rule. I, I'm sure that when he was eight years old, he wasn't making the decisions for the, the country, but he was under advisors. But at least now it, it tells us of one of his actions. He starts to lead out. And apparently, as you can tell from the story, uh, they had been collecting money. I guess when people go into the temple, the doorkeepers were taking an offering. It's not so different from what we do in Jackson Heights. And the money was specifically to start using uh, to the, the specifically to start making repairs on the temple. So right away, the fact that Josiah would give this order to um, Chopin to go and get the money and put it into action, already it tells us a little bit about what Josiah was concerned about. He was interested to renew the worship of the Lord, Yahweh, right? And I mentioned already about the, uh, the interesting verse 7. We'll get back to that. But let's take a look at what happens next, because that's how the story got rolling. But now the intrigue really starts in verse 8. Let's go back. And this is, these are the verses that Emmanuel read earlier. Then Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan, the scribe, came to the king and brought word to the king. Her servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have handed it over to the workmen who have oversight over the house of the Lord. Moreover, Shaphan, the scribe, oh, excuse me. Moreover, Shaphan, the scribe, informed the king, saying, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it in the presence of the king. And get this, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. So the, the interesting thing was, somehow Hilkiah the priest has been managing these funds, right, that have been collected and donated to the, the temple. Somewhere along the line, in the process, he finds something that he calls the book of the law. Uh it's probably Deuteronomy. I mean, it doesn't say what the book is, but based on the rest of the story and the way they respond to it, it's a good chance that it was Deuteronomy, which had the blessings and cursings, you know, and, and told the people what their part of the covenant was, right? But in any case, the, um, the reforms that Josiah was about to enact are in direct response to what he heard from the book of the law, right? So I would like to say that uh, this is one of the elements that we're going to get to of what is the ingredient in revival, right? But there's something that comes even before that. Whatever book this was, when Josiah heard it read in his presence by his scribe, Shaphan, right? It says he tore his clothes. I, I think we understand why he did that, right? He realized that whatever was written in the book of the law the people were not following. They weren't keeping up with the, the requirements and expectations of God. That's one thing. But the fact that he tore his clothes meant show that he, he was a sensitive individual. He was responsive to God. You know the stories. There were a lot of kings that couldn't even care less what God wanted them to do or what the people wanted. But that's not the case in Jos with Josiah. When Josiah heard this new information from the outside and he realized, whoa, we're not keeping this at all. He was grief stricken. He made the demonstration of grief that showed that he was repentant. He was moved. He had a heart that responded to God. I would say he had a good heart. As a matter of fact, if you jump down for a minute to verses 18 and 19, uh, <clears throat> the story unfolds where when, when Josiah discovered this, he wanted to find out what the prophetess would say about it. And the prophetess gives a, an extended um, statement from God, but in verse 18, he, uh, the direction to the king of Judah, that means Josiah, is says, but to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what you shall say to him. In other words, in contrast with what God had just spoken to the rest of the nation, he says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says regarding the words which you have heard. And in verse 19, he says this, this is God speaking. Since your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become the object of a horror and a curse. And you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I have indeed heard you, declares the Lord. And he promises that 
Josiah would have a peaceful rule. But the point here is, we're looking at the ingredients that go into revival. And what I'm making the claim here is, the first ingredient is to have a good heart, a heart that's sensitive to God, a heart that's open to God. Even God himself testified this about Josiah. He had a tender heart and a responsive heart. Now notice, I, I didn't say the first step in revival is good hearts, although I believe that applies too. But I said the word singular, a good heart. And there's a historical reason for me to say that. I think you guys know from reading the Bible for so many years that in the ancient world, as the king went, the nation went, right? In the ancient world, it seems unfortunate for the people themselves. But whatever the king did, if the king was good, the nation was blessed. If the king was bad, the nation went downhill. It was like the inextricable. There was no separation, kind of like we have somewhat nowadays, although, you know, leadership can still have a big effect on uh, the lives of the people, no doubt. Uh, so the first ingredient in revival, the first ingredient in the recipe for revival, I'm going to make the claim, is a good heart. Now let's go back and look at that verse 7. This is the very interesting thing, right? You remember what it said in verse 7? It uh, typically, when uh, a group, an institution, a company, especially a nation, is going to undertake some renovations or some project that involves money, you have to have an audit, right? We have auditors right here in our congregation. And the church certainly has very uh, uh, straightforward and regimented procedures for doing audits. So now... Josiah had just issued this command to go use the money that had been collected to start the repairs. He says, and you know what? Don't even worry about accounting for it. He says, because these guys are trustworthy. How does he say here? However, verse 7, no accounting shall be made with them for the money because they deal honestly. I would like to suggest that give, this shows us the second ingredient that goes into a revival. We already said that the heart of the leader was good. But these workers, you can say, the people who are participating in the project, they were also honest and ethical. They were honest and ethical citizens. In our contest, uh, context as a church, if we're thinking about revival as a church, what this means is that the church brothers and sisters have to be honest and ethical. This is the second ingredient. The first ingredient was a good heart. I want to call the second ingredient good faith. Good faith. That we all operate in a good faith and a cooperative spirit among all the members, not just the leader. Now, this should not be shocking to anyone. Respect for leadership and cooperation and honesty have been values that have been promoted in most cultures of the world for all time. As a matter of fact, the unusual, uh, the aberrant, uh, example in history is probably 21st century American culture and other Western cultures that are highly individualistic that don't really uh, esteem uh, leadership and authority. But this is like the, the, the historical innovation. This is not the way it goes. I remember uh, my wife every once in a while when, we, when some issue comes up that we observe or w watch on the news, Alana will sometimes quote to me sometime, something she learned when she was a Girl Scout. Let me see if I can find it. Their, their motto was this, obey first before you complain. Obey first before you complain. What it's, what it's telling, what they were instructed to do, what that means is when you're part of a process, when you're not in the leadership position and you're giving and you're given instructions, you may question the instructions. You may think, well, wait a minute, why are we doing this? I, I know a better way. You know, obviously everybody has their own mind, but the instruction was, before you start to complain and criticize, just go along with the program and see how it turns out, right? And then after you've established that, you can then make your uh, input known. This is not just something from the Girl Scouts. This is not just something from culture in general around the world. Anybody who has read anything in, in Ellen White's writings know how much she talks about the need for all of us, leaders and, and members alike, to have humble spirits, right? To not always be ready to upset everything, but rather to, to give the benefit of the doubt to each other, 
to, to trust each other like Josiah trusted these working people. So what was the second thing I said? For, for a revival to happen, you need a good heart. You also need to have good faith, right? This is an expression. Let's do everything we can in good faith. And like I said, this applies to everybody, uh, leaders and, and otherwise. All right, let's go back to the sequence of the story now and discover uh, what happened with this book. What, what was it? Uh, what did jo Josiah do when he, he read this book? <clears throat> I call this the next section good input, right? Like what we saw here is Hilkiah said he in verse 8, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. He gives the book to Shaphan. Shaphan then reads it to the, the king. I mentioned this earlier. And with this new input, with this new set of information, uh, the king all of a sudden realized that the whole nation was off course. So what I would like to suggest is that the third element in revival is what I will call good input. Right? Like I said earlier, it doesn't say which what this book was. Well, people think it was the book of Deuteronomy because it has like that blessings and cursings motif. But if we would apply the concept more generally, I would say this. In order for there to be revival, so that a group of people get back right track, we need good teaching. Specifically, we need the, the teachings of the word of God coming into our hearts. And I will uh, give you a little preview. Starting in February, I hope, uh, the new pastor and I and the elders are going to start working on a series of sermons. We'll all do, you know, our own individual take on it. But we're going to try to look at the teachings of Jesus himself. We call ourselves Christians. We said uh, on New Year's Eve when we were talking about the church that the definition of the church are those people who came to believe in Jesus, commit to Jesus, and follow his teachings. So for the first few months of the year, February, March, April, maybe, we're going to look to see what Jesus taught us. If we can let those words come into our hearts, that is a component of revival, right? Good input. Now, let's, listen to the funny thing here. I just want to point this out. Hilkiah apparently found the, the, the book somewhere in the temple. That means that the book was lost, right? That the, the people were going about, they were worshiping God. They were worshiping all kinds of other idols too, right? We know that, and you'll see that later in a minute. Uh, but their situation is much different from ours. They didn't even have the word. We have multiple copies of the Bible in all different translations. I have probably uh, uh, 14 or 15 of them right here on my shelf. And not to mention what we have in our phones or on our computers, right? They didn't have the Bible handy like we do, but the principle holds for revival and renewal to occur. People need to have good input, good teaching, because that fuels good outcomes. All right, so, so far, good hearts, good faith, good input. Let's keep going. Watch what happens next. We're going to turn over to the, the next chapter, chapter 23. Uh, let me see which verses we start with. Yeah, right at the beginning, chapter 23, verses 1 to 3. So uh, after consulting the prophetess and, you know, being a, uh, affirmed by God, then Josiah takes the second step in action. He says, then the king sent messengers and gathered, and, he, and they gathered to him all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. So all the leaders of the people. And the king went up to the house of the Lord and every man of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, the whole group, the whole population, along with the priests, the prophets and all the people from the small to the great. And he read in their presence, all the words of the book of the covenant. So it tell it narrows it down. It's telling us, this is the statement of God's contract with the people, right? He reads the words to the people, uh, all the words that, which was found in the house of the Lord. And it says, verse three, the King stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments his provisions and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to carry out the words of this covenant that were written in the book. And it, all the people, it says, entered into the covenant. So this, I would suggest, is the third element. The people not only heard the information, but they responded. 
The third element is about the, the response. It's about a decision. It's about a decision that people make individually and as a group. It's a decision to commit. And specifically, it's a decision to commit to God and his covenant. It also says it's wholehearted commitment. Now, if we take this, what I would, how I would like to label this, the fourth element is this is goodwill. This is goodwill. And I use the word will in the sense of your choice or your decision, or in Latin, as they would say, volition, right? We have that word come down to us in English. A goodwill is a good decision. So part of uh, revival is to exercise the will to rededicate to, to God in a heartfelt and true manner. You remember the four parts so far, good heart, good faith, good input. Now I'm adding in good will, as in the will to commit. All right, let's keep going. From 23 again, chapter 23, from verse, uh, from verse 4 until verse 20, this is a long list now of all the different things that uh, Josiah got rid of. Let me just read verse 4 just to, to, to give you an example. It says, then the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, the priests of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the utensils that had been made for Baal, or we say Baal, for Asherah, and for all the heavenly lights. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron Valley and carried their ashes to Bethel. So in other words, Josiah starts purging all of the false worship, all the things that he found out in the book of the Lord. Hey, we're not supposed to be doing this. We're supposed to be dedicated to the one true God, right, who brought us up out of Egypt. I'm not going to read the, all of that passage because the details get pretty intense, but you get the idea. It, uh, our, for our purposes, the fifth element in revival, I would like to say, is for us to get rid of distractions. Get rid of things that will draw us off course. Get rid, get rid of the things that will turn our focus away from the higher and beautiful things. In other words, to achieve revival, especially at the beginning of the year, we need to reassess. We need to refocus. We need to purge our lives from things that are really just not so helpful. I remember many years ago, sometimes when you're young and you, you're in a new place, you remember things even as insignificant as they are. But I remember when I first moved out of my parents' home and I was in the upstate New York, I was in the health food store and uh, I was talking to somebody and somehow the topic came up about how our wallets, you know, men wear wallets in their back pockets, right? They're foldable. Somehow they're, they, they start off very thin, but then over time they, get, they start getting fatter and fatter. And I'm not talking about from money. I'm talking about from like notes that you keep uh, people's, uh, what do you call them? Uh, business cards, you know, who knows what else? In my case, I have a guitar pick in there and they just get fatter and fatter as the months go on. And he said, yeah, you have to do something called a wallet purge every few months. You got to like go through it and throw it out. That's what we're talking about here. This is the fifth element. It's being able to make choices, make choices, not about the wallet, but where are we going to invest our time, right? How are we going to invest our energy? Sometimes it means even changing your setting, your physical situation. If you know, for example, I don't know, maybe you spend too much time at the TV or the computer, more likely. Maybe a thing you can do is close up the computer, put it in a drawer. You know, just that little change in, in the physical setting can help you to refocus your mind. So you need to invest your time, change, manage your setting, manage our time, manage our focus. I call this. This fifth ingredient I call good choices. Good choices. So do we want to have spiritual revival this year? Then we need to make good choices about where we invest our time, our energy, and, and our attention. All right, there's one more. It's in the chapter 23 again. This time we're going to skip all the litany of things that Josiah got rid of. We're going to jump down to verse 21. 21 to 23. This is the next and the last thing I'm going to comment on. In verse 21, it says, Then the king commanded all the people, saying, Celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in this book of the covenant. And then it goes on to comment, Truly, such a Passover had not been celebrated since the days of the judges, you get that, who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings, 
and the kings, uh, the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. All right, so this is the sixth element, right? Jo Josiah reinstated the Passover celebra celebration. That was one of God's festivals prescribed in the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy, uh, Leviticus, excuse me. It was one of the festivals in which the whole country was asked to come together to Jerusalem to do worship acts, to do cele uh, ceremonial acts that helped them to remember who they were, to remember their past, to remember their present identity, right? In fact, as I was thinking about this, this is my sixth element, right? Sixth ingredient. I, I realized I could call this by two different names, which are both accurate and both bring out a different aspect of the issue. I could say that this one is, you want revival? You have to have good company, good company, because all the people were together, right? And they weren't just together. They were together and they were focused in on something together. Like I said, focused in on their history, focused in on their calling, focused in on their relationship to God. It's kind of like what we're doing now with the 10 days of prayer, right? Isn't that what we're doing? We're coming together. We're focusing together. We're, we're thinking about who we are, what we want to be. I'll even go further than that. That's basically what we do every week. In church, we come together. We, we uh, gather together. It's, it's a good company. In prayer meeting, we do the same, and, and Vespers as well. It's being together with each other, keeping God in mind, and listening for his spirit. Then I realized I could also call this something else that's going to sound a little funny at first. Uh, not only is it good company, these festivals, right, these occasions that we create, but we could also call it good times, good times. Now, when we talk about good times now, we usually think about parties or travels or times that we're all relaxed together. And those are fine. There's nothing wrong with them. But we don't always think about the religious events in our lives, right, and these ancient festivals. We don't always think about those as good times, but they were. Just think about it. They were special occasions. Everybody left home. They were all in Jerusalem. It was like not being on vacation in a way, right? They got away from their everyday routines. They saw all these new sights and sounds. There were all these different uh, activities that were meaningful. Certainly, they had meaning, but they were also happy. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Nothing. It's fine. So this is the sixth uh, ingredient. You could call it good company. You could call it good times. And again, that's kind of like what church is. I know that some people, especially when they're young and they're kind of coerced to go to church, maybe they don't quite think of church as a, a, a good time, you know. But I think the rest of us who are here of our own volition, there's a reason we gather together. It's because we like it, right? We're in good company and we're having good times. So there you have it. Six ingredients for revival. At, at during this beginning of the years to go along with our 10 days of prayer and its focus on revival. I gave six ingredients in the recipe for revival. The first is good heart, being open, having a genuine response to God. Uh, we can have an effect on that. We can make the choice to open our hearts to God and let his spirit work in us. So good heart, good faith, treating each other in good faith, being responsible to each other, cooperating with each other, yeah, we'll have our opinions that we can share. But as my wife's uh, Girl Scout troop said, let's cooperate first and then we can complain later. Let's start from scratch and give each other the benefit of the doubt that everybody is, has good intentions. So good heart, good faith, good input. Start, you know, let the word of God roll over us. Whether we like it or not, it's going to have its effect, right? When good information comes to us, when good teaching comes to us, it can't help but have its effect. The sad thing is the opposite is true, too. False information and bad information has its effect as well. So let's seek good input, good heart, good faith, good input, good will, a good decision to uh, open ourselves up to God again. Let's take the opportunity to dedicate ourselves to God again. Say hello. Make that commitment again, a good will. Then we make good choices. We eliminate the distractions. We do what we can to use our time more wisely, right? And dedicate our attention to things that are more important. And finally, good times, good company, right? Uh, going to church, spending time 
with things that are, are special and enjoying it so that we can uh, be blessed. What do you think? Amen. Thank you, Sister Drupati, for encouraging us to follow the program and giving me the reason to look at this topic for today. Thank you. Uh, for our closing song, we will be singing the song, Take My Life and Let It Be, on hymn number 330. Now for the benediction. Dear Lord, I come to you to thank you for the message of revive, revival, that we need to humble ourselves to get together with the company that we keep, that we have good choices, and we make, uh, that we love each other, and continue to bless as we grow. And uh, with, the, with the prayers that we're having on, in the evening, that we can just open our hearts to, to you and that we can receive answers of your love and of your wisdom and of the choices we make and the companies we keep. I just continue blessings for everyone. This I ask in your precious name. Amen. We'll be singing Amen. We Have This Hope on hymn number 214.